Good. Share screen, grab the PowerPoint. Okay. All right, so we promised mycology. We're going to have mycology. So we have an introductory lecture today. It's not too bad. Uh, and then we will have a lab today, which if you hadn't been down to the lab yet, it's kind of smelling um, like a microbrewery down there. Your yeast are really growing well. There's a couple of, of the, um, the molds that are growing well. One in particular is really growing well. But there's a couple of them that aren't growing well. So I know we're going to we'll work with what we have. Um, I did note just if you didn't do this, if you get your plates today and you don't have the organism that you plated on your plate, I don't know which organism you had. So um, we'll just <laughs> go from there. You were supposed to put your name, organism, and date. Uh, that's okay. So we'll see what we have growing. The yeast are really growing great, and they're smelling up the, the lab really great. So we do have that. And what we're going to do is take some cornmeal auger today. So it's a different kind of auger. We're going to punch uh, cookies out of it. We're going to flip those cookies over on top of the auger. We're going to inoculate. We're going to put a cover slide over those, and we're going to plate those on the countertop for the rest of the time and see what they're looking like when we get back from fall break. They should really look good, hopefully. Should. Um, hadn't decided yet if we're going to actually microscope out some of the yeast so you can see the yeast under the scope. Uh, we usually um, can do that. That's really quick. And then we, if we think we have time, I think we will, we'll start working through. I'm going to give you a printout of the slides key. Uh, the mycology slide key is, is we can give it to you today. It's already been opened up on Blackboard with the slides. So what we'll do if we will run, hopefully have time to run through those um, and start to pick out the favorites of, of the different. If there's a group of same on, the, on there, we can limit it down. I think there's over 100 slides and we'll limit that down some. Um, so that you'll know what to study for the final lab exam. Still promise you I go back through and we'll, we need to add some things to both labs. We need to look, see what we've done. And so that, that grade should start to look a little different when I start putting the tens in. Just hadn't done that yet. So I'll get to it, I promise. Um, and lead up to that if you're still wondering why you have a uh, not what you want in lab grade. Everybody's passing, but some of those grades need to come up with the final. So the key for both finals that we get it done. Any questions? Schedule-wise, we know what we're doing. We're recording and we're ready to roll. So all these are classified as fungi. So whether it's a yeast or a mold, um, we, we classify them all in the group of fungi and we need to know why is it important that we know these? Well, our patients will get infected with these. So that's why it's important and it falls into micro. So this is on your sheet, right? Is this y'all's PowerPoint? Before I get too far. It's a little different. Okay. I'm uh, starting to see a little difference already. So, okay, there we go. Probably updated here. Sorry. Um, around 120,000 species of fungi been described uh, a few years ago. Between 2.2 and 3.8 million species. Less than a hundred of those species routinely cause disease, though. So we're not going to ask you to, you know, worry about the 2.2 million species. We're going to limit it down for you. So what, what do we need to know? Um, influence their pathogenicity is there. They do have the ability to cause disease. So they do match our bacteria because they can grow at 37 degrees Celsius. That's body temp. And they evade the host defense systems that we learned in immunology, whether specific or nonspecific. 
and they have the ability to grow when oxygen levels are low. So they have a low oxygen reduction potential. So just some classifying with this is a little history, a little history with uh, Agostino Bassi. Know how to do on that one, okay? All right, I'll go. All right, now 1835. Uh, I, this isn't like, oh my gosh, what's this? But in 1835, he just proved that silkworms had this muscardian um, infection caused by a fungus, um, Boviera, Boviria bassiana. So if you find something, get to name it after yourself. So that's where Bassiana came from. That's my last name. I'm gonna tag that in there. This was the first documented case of a fungal disease in animals. 1900, Darling characterized the pathogenicity of the fungus Histoplasma capsulatum. A couple of key uh, timelines as to how long we've been dealing with funguses. And then we have our uh, French physician, Raymond. Who, anybody taking French? No, not even, nobody? Really, nothing? Um, Savaron, is that how you would say Savaron, French? Does that sound French? We'll keep saying it that way. Uh, Y'all used uh, his auger um, the other day. That's what you put your uh, organisms on, your, your fungi on there on Tuesday. Uh, dermatologist and a mycologist published a comprehensive study of the dermatophytic fungi, Les Tigas. The majority of the techniques used today, isolate and identify fungi were developed by Raymond. Because of his major contribution, he is considered the father of mycology. So if you ever get a question that says who is considered the father of mycology, hope you will remember the auger that you used, right? Sabaron's auger. And you'll be able to answer that correctly. We'll play on words here from the late Mr. Payne. Uh, fungal physiology. I like that. Right? Paying attention, yeah. Right, I'll just warn out. I can't wait for next week. I can't wait. Um, fungal physiology. The fungi are eukaryotic. So that is a big difference between where we've been. We've been with prokaryotes uh, since the beginning of our um, semester. So they're like a plant. Uh, and animal species, uh, pro bacteria or prokaryotes. While fungi are once considered to be tiny plant-like organisms, they're unique and they have their own kingdom. Okay, so I've um, got the fungi kingdom sitting right here. So got their own kingdom. That's big, right? When you get your own kingdom. Their cell membrane contains uh, ergosterols. The membrane of animals contains cholesterol. So it's similar, but it's not cholesterol. Uh, the nucleus is bound by a nuclear membrane. Prokaryotes, of course, have no nucleus or nuclear membrane. So they are different than bacteria. The organelles, fungal cells contain endoplasmic reticulum. Hey, that sounds familiar. Mitochondria. Um, ADS ribosomes like plants and animals. Bacteria have the 70S ribosome. Unlike plants, fungi do not have chloroplasts, so they cannot generate their own energy source like a plant. They don't have the chlorophyll they do the photosynthesis with. They're heterotrophic, which means they must obtain preformed organic substances, so they're unable to synthesize what they need. Okay, so like plant, um, they have to um, they appear to have tastes similar to ours because fungal media loves potatoes, potato flake auger, and we're going to put them on cornmeal today. And there's also tomato juice auger. So if you like tomato juice, you like cornmeal, you like potatoes, you like fungi. Right? Yay. <laughs> oh, here's something. This, this may, you didn't get a picture of this in your handout, but 
you're a college student, so this doesn't end with college, but how many times have you gone into the refrigerator, seen something you had there like a hot dog, and you're like, ah, that's a better be okay. You know, yeah, the date's August. I got them when I first came up here, but now it's December, and they kind of look a little off, and, um, you know, it is, it is processed meat, so surely it has a longer date than need, right? Y'all don't, wouldn't eat this. Y'all wouldn't eat a moldy hot dog. Okay, so there's really some good experiments, usually in your refrigerator, uh, when it comes to uh, mycology. <coughs> Animals have an in, ingestive type of nutrition. They must take into food into their bodies. They digest it. Fungi produce a hydrolytic enzyme that degrades the substrates. They take the macromolecules like protein and starches and they break them down into the peptides and simple sugars, which are absorbed in, by the fungus. The cell wall of the fungi is composed of chitin that of plants is composed of cellulose, while animals or cells are not bound by a cell wall. So we see a kite. All right, so question for you. Now we started this, how many of you were interested in knowing the difference between a mold and a yeast? Is there a difference? We'll start there, we're gonna start simple. So what is the difference between the yeast that you plated and the mold you plated on Tuesday? Well, that's an excellent question, Mr. Rector. I wasn't even thinking that. I didn't even think there was a difference, right? They're both fungi. They're both under that kingdom name. They both have all the characteristics we've talked to up to now. Does one like need a host and the other doesn't or something? I don't know, it's a guess. Good guess, but that's not what I'm looking for. No, oh, it's simple in characteristics. It's just one thing or the other. Think back. So what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to create some spore forming, growing lines of cells on our molds but we're not gonna attempt that with our yeast. So why are we doing that? Anybody looked it up? How are you looking it up? Yeah. What you got? This yeast is a single cell. Single cell, very simple. And molds are? Uh, molds are cellular. There you go. That's it. That's what I wanted to start with. That's the simplest way simplest beginning for us to talk about the differences in them. Because they're named, you know, we're all going to kind of run together on that final when you start looking at that slide. But yeast, single cell, okay, and they bud out from that single cell and form a new one. Looks like they're spitting, especially if you find them in urines, right? You're doing a urine. Heather, you did urines and body fluids, right? Well, I think she did, and I think she should have looked in the urine and found some yeast, right? Yeast infection shows up in urines, and it'll look like it'll be a mix between, is that a bacteria or is that a big white cell? What's going on? But budding yeast are fun to find because you can't miss those. So urines are definitely a place we look for yeast, okay? Molds, on the other hand, are multicellular. They form hyphae. Okay, so they branch, they look like they're uh, trying to reroot themselves is what it'll look like. So it's really looks familiar to a plant root system. <clears throat> so here we go. The identification of molds involves evaluation of the characteristic of the colony. Macroscopic morphology includes description of the surface and reverse. Characteristic of the microscopic morphology includes description of the vegetative and reproductive structure. So that's what we're gonna see. We'll see some of the macroscopic on our slides, but most of what we're looking at is the microscopic, and that's the vegetative state. 
There's very little in the way of biochemical identification, okay? Dermatophytes are the exception, but for the most part, we're just going to have to call it from what we see. Now, we can stain it, right? So, you think of fungal infections, you think of, right, we've talked about, you know, <coughs> Uh, skin, having fungal infections, uh, with immunocompromised patients, AIDS patients. That's what we're thinking on, on when we start to see these in our patients or on our patients. So molds are filamentous organisms composed of hyphae. And a hyphae is a tube-like structure which elongates by growth of the tip the apical end, like the growing end. If you had botany, you know the apical end of any plant is where it's blooming and growing and extending itself. Uh, these are the vegetative structures are responsible for the fluffy filamentous nature of molds. And we've got a good one downstairs. It has covered the plate. It just has like made its big, mm, make its big efforts like a big white mountain of like somebody yeah, it's going to be cool when you see this one. Um, we were hoping for more. We didn't get but one really awesome downstairs. Uh, they have septa and septums are cross walls that divide the hyphae into numerous cells. So these septa have tiny pores in their cytoplasm and it's continuous throughout the hyphae. So there's connection. So it's not like one of these hyphae walls off and, and there's no movement through uh, as you know, plants do the same thing, you know, root system, you know, the cells of a, a tree allow the water to move, you know, through the tree, whether it be a monocot or dicot, I remember those kind of names. That's about all the botany we'll spend time on. Septate hyphae contains septa throughout the length of the filament. And then we got co-inocytic hyphae, which uh, formerly called non-septic or aseptic septate hyphae. Traditionally, they have been defined as hyphae lacking septa, but in truth, all hyphae have septa, but for co hyphae, they may be very few in number. So we have the hyphae, right, connected with set is in the septa. And then we have this thing that we call a mycelium, which is a mass of hyphae. We're definitely going to see some pictures coming up, so. Uh, there are three basic types of mycelium, mycelia, sorry. There's the vegetative, there's the aerial, and there's the fertile. So if it's vegetated, the, the my, mycelium penetrates the medium to absorb nutrients. If it's aerial, it grows above the surface of the medium as supportive structure. Or if it's fertile, it consists of structures which bear the canidia or spores for reproduction. Okay, so what we're going to try, what, what we're going to try while you're not here next week, is we're trying to create this mycelium. Okay, so right now we've got the mold on top of the auger growing, and we're going to try to move that over to another plate and give it a little space, to give it a little room to grow up, right? And start moving toward a slide and try to stick to the slide so that I can show you uh, in a couple of weeks, what it looks like. The mycelium, which gives the mold calling its texture, the topographical, smooth, wrinkled, and color. So we've got mycelium on one definitely down there uh, today. Um, last time we grew them up, we had you know some, we call them get furry, right? So things were coming up off the plate a little bit, kind of growing up kind of branching, not branching, but kind of furring up. So hopefully you'll get to see at least the one down there today. So that's what we're talking about. So here's our plate. We have one that's done this, uh, one of our species down there, has covered the entire plate. And it is um, awesome, right? Because they just cover it. This is the vegetative and aerial hyphae. Okay, so let's go back and look at those two names, right? They're vegetative and aerial are kind of separated here, basic types. Vegetative penetrates the medium to absorb the nutrients. The aerial grows above the surface. 
So here is what? Which one's this down here? The vegetative hyphae, right? Trying to link in kind of this is the aerial hyphae starting to lead up, starting to branch up and then forms a head here. To subculture a mold, remove any portion of the colony and transfer it to a new medium. So this is what we're doing today. You're going to remove a little piece of wherever you can get off that plate, okay, and move it over to a new medium to inoculate your cookie that you're cutting. There's something called rhizoids. Rhizoids are a portion of the vegetative mycelium, which consists of a root-like structure. So rhizoids are you know, the roots and rhizoids are where the nitrogen binds on a plant root. I don't know if you, do y'all have botany at all? No? You didn't even have it in biology? When you studied life, y'all didn't study plants? No? That's, that's biology too. Right? No? I don't. All right. And then we have these stolons. Uh, which are structures that are hom homologous to the runners of plants. Has everybody seen a runner of plants, right? <coughs> like if root get, if you think about a root on top of the soil, it's, it's running or a runner. No, no runners. Rhizoids and stalins are uh, only found in zygomycetes, zygom zygomycetes, mycetes, right? Zygomycetes. Kate, help me out there. Did you say it right? Zygomycetes, my seats, my seats, zygomycetes, seeds. Thank you. All right. So we're gonna start there with the molds. Now we're gonna move to the yeast. Remember, yeast were who? They were the single cell fungi. We can identify them by a combination of biochemical tests. We we could if we had next you know if we had another week of lab, we had uh, API strips for for mycology, and we could have ID'd our yeast. Right? I know you're disappointed you don't get to another do another API strip. Just one more, just one more API. Um, we could have done a biochemical test with the yeast. We have a pattern of biochemical reactions with yeast. And we can also do microscopic morphology with yeast. So there was, there was two ways we could have handled the yeast. And we're tempted to use the microscopic today. Um, yeast are fungi which form discrete, smooth, uh, moist colonies composed of spherical to ep uh, ellipsoidal cells. They reproduce by budding, producing a blastoconidia. Blastoconidia is the result of asexual reproduction. So yeast have asexual reproduction. And they bud, and you can see that budding uh, even in a urine cult, in a urinalysis, you can see it. They're the ones that are really, really smelling good downstairs, like we're brewing a microbrewery. And they all grew really well. Uh, this is yeast forming the blastoconidia. And we're going to see plenty of, a few, I think a few of these, I'm going to say a plenty, but. <clears throat> so yeast have something known as pseudohyphae. Remember we said molds had hyphae. Well, pseudohyphae, as the daughter cell enlarges, constriction develops between the parent and the daughter, and it looks like two cells that are separated by a septa. Okay, to form a chain of blastoconidia, which elongates, so we can look at, all right? So this may have take appearance of a, a hyphae. They also have germ tubes. A yeast cell produces a filament by elongation without constriction at the point of origin of the parent cell. And the germ tube is beginning to uh, the formation of a true hyphae. So we see these, this would be the hyphae. And this is a picture from your group that you'll be looking at. Okay, we're going to get plenty of practice with this in the next couple of weeks. Uh, yeast are dimorphic fungi. 
meaning they're able to grow in two different forms. So what we have right now, usually dependent upon the temperature, most grow uh, as yeast from at 37 degrees on enriched media or host tissue. We put them right on Savonour, uh, dextrose auger. Uh, they then grow as a mold at room temperature. Oh. So we kind of have yeast that are one form or the other, so they switch. So now that you have seen that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our yeast that we have today and we're going to try to move them into their dimorphic form, okay, by growing them not on sat, we have seven hour, but we're going to switch over uh, to cornmeal auger and leave those at room temp, okay, so we're going to change the temperature of their growth right now and put them in a room temp setting. What is asexual reproduction? The asexual reproduction is the formation, gives us the formation of the canidia. Asexual uh, propagules are the result of mitosis. Okay, and the canidia is Latin for dust. Asexual propagules formed at the end of the aerial hyphae, formed by mitosis and cytoplasmic cleavage. Let's take a look at the canidia. Oops, we ain't got to the look yet. We gotta go canidial four, specialized hyphae that bear the canidia and the filialids. Phyalides, would you go phyalides there? Okay, phyalides, weird. Are you tired? I need help, I need help with these words. We got. Phyolytic. Phi? Are we going phi? Sure. Phyolytics. These are the cylindrical or flash shaped cells which form uh, cells from the canidia are produced. So here is our Aspergillia species. We had one of these downstairs. I think this is the one that is. No, I don't think this, this might be the one that's taken off. I can't remember which one's taken off. But we have. Um, a foot cell, we have a stalk, we have the canidia four, which is the whole thing. The canidias are up here at the top, okay, and then we have the phyllides up here. So that canidia attaches to the phyllidia here, the vesicle here, stalk there, foot cell. So we're going to see a, the aspergillus is Excellent. We won't miss that one. But here is electromicrograph of it. We won't be able to do that, but this kind of gives you the idea of this the canidia for all this, right? And then here is our phyllidias with the canidias attached up on the top. And there's our picture that we're looking at. Once stained, definitely see the head of the aspergillus. Penicillium, we have that downstairs too. Um, here, and this is what we're trying, we're going to try to create this, you know, in the next couple of weeks. This is what we're going to, you're going to miss out on a little bit. But again, definitely have the canidia attached to the phyllides, the canidia four is everything below the, the, and the canidia, canidia, conidia. There it is. So you're, this is kind of a preview of what you're going to be studying for the final. You're basically going to have to tell me that's aspergillus and that's penicillium. That's the kind of thing that we're going to do. Okay, so it's definitely the stain structures that you're going to need to know. So more uh, sporangial spores, asexual spores formed in the sac like structure known as sporangium. Sporangio 4, specialized hyphae that bear the sporangium. The columella, right, columella, sterile dome with the apex of the sporangio 4. The arthrocanidia 
thickened segments of the septate hyphae that become detached at septum firm fragmentation. So let's take a look at this thing. So here's our sporangial spores, all in this big head of the sporangium. This is the apophysis, this is sporangial spores, this is the stalin, these are the rhizoids down here, kind of the root system. This is a mucor species. This is, looks to me, this is the uh, golf ball on the tee. And we're gonna have little descriptions in your key that you're gonna be working with this afternoon to start off. So you're gonna have to recognize mucor based on this structure. And this is what we mean. We've got, well, you want to you want to look at this one or you want to look at that one? You want to look at this one, you want to look at that. Yeah. That's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna circle up some, make some decisions on certain ones today. Arthro, Canidia, a big mess. Okay, it's a big mess there. It kind of looks, uh, somebody brought me some mold the other day, earlier in the semester, and it kind of looked like this. It kind of had that, didn't it? Multi cells together. It was rough, but I think we came up with something, found something looked like this. All right, so that's the A sexual reproduction. There is sexual reproduction. It's the union of two haploid nuclei to produce a zygote, just like what we think of as sexual reproduction, a diploid nuclei. Then we undergo meiosis following forming the four haploid nuclei. So this is sexual reproduction. Zygomycetes, uh, two hyphal tips undergo fusion to form a reproductive structure. And the ascomycetes, sexual spores are contained within a special sac structure called the ascus. Bacidiomycetes, sexual spores formed at the tip of the minute stalks. And another definition is fungi imperfecti, species in which sexual stage has not been demonstrated, either unknown or absent. And this phylum contains the majority of the human pathogens. Okay, fungi imperfecti. Perfect fungi, fungi that reproduce sexually, teleomorph, anamorph, Teleo is sexual form of fungi. Anamorph is an asexual form of the fungus. Y'all doing good on these slides? Y'all still have all these? Okay. And then look at some of these names. Okay, did you want to give that one? got Boidy and then uh, Apiospermum. What about all this other stuff? Anybody want to take those on? If you didn't know what I'm doing, I'm looking for my parasitologist helper next semester is what I'm, I'm trying to figure out. He's going to be my helper. Uh, I'll try Suda or we can go about Sudalis Sharia Boydy, that good. I can work our way through it. Uh, Skeetosporium, how about that? All right, some fungal metabolism. Cytoplasmic cell membrane controls the diffusion of the nutrients. Remember, we said with fungus that they absorb their nutrients. The major sterol is er, uh, ergosterol, while cholesterol is found in mammalian cells. Amphotericin B, I think we mentioned that. Remember that one? Did we talk about amphotericin B in the group of antimicrobials? Yay, remember? Yay. Is that just not on the test Tuesday? Amphotericin B is an effective antifungal drug because it has a greater affinity for the er ergosterol than the cholesterol. 
so it doesn't hurt the mammalian cell, it goes straight after the fungus. It binds to the membrane sterols, causing a leakage of potassium, which that sounds familiar, right? We destroy a cell, we release potassium. As y'all should in hematology realize that when you lyse the red blood cell, you release potassium. That's why when you hemolyze your specimen and it goes to the chemistry department, they get pitch a fit because you can't run a potassium on a hemolyzed specimen. Well, that potassium inhibits metabolic processes such as glycolysis and respiration. Azole derivatives block the synthesis of ergostol. Most fungi are aerobic, but some are facultative, like yeast. There are no strict anaerobes. So, unbeknownst, right, when you think of fungi, you probably think of what? Low oxygen, wet, moist environment, right? Well, you're good on the west, wet and moist, but you're not good on the what? The, the aerobic is where we want to go. Uh, fungi tolerate a wide variation in their pH. Fungi prefer a moist environment, but spores and canidia survive harsh environments. They have a survival mechanism. Those spores, just like our C. diff spore that comes out, has a way of finding its way in, in surviving uh, harsh cleaning, harsh bleaching, or whatever. Uh, optimum growth occurs at 25 to 37, so room temp up to body temp. And we have some more. We have saprophytic fungi. Like bacteria, they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere. They grow abundantly in moist soil, decayed <laughs> vegetation. Their spores are easily airborne, providing an easy mean for dispersal. Until recently, these fungi are considered to be an environmental fungi found on bread and fruit. Their appearance in laboratory media was considered to be a result of contamination. Mm -hmm. Maybe, right? And that's what you do. I mean, that's the, you know, when we pull out a, a, a auger plate, I hope y'all have seen these, right? Some of them are like, ooh, what's this, right? We've had some of those, right? That's probably a fungus girl. Uh, there was no clinical significance attributed to their isolation. We know some of these as harmless molds, grow equally as well human tissue. Uh, the host defense takes over if, it, if you are a compromise. Um, under appropriate conditions, some saprophytic are able to cause opportunistic infection. So for the most part, a saprophytic fungi is harmless. But Predisposing factors such as treatment with broad spectrum antibiotics, chronic metabolic disease such as diabetes, maybe a new neoplastic disorder like leukemia, lymphomas, and cancer, cytotoxic drugs for therapy for, and for cancer therapy, and then of course immunosuppressin with transplant therapy, corticosteroids, treatment, and AIDS. So this is our story. So if you end up working at a cancer center, we have one where right behind NEA, right? I think um, you may encounter some fungi in patients. So aspergillosis, right? That would be an infection with aspergillus, right? What we would think. The disease caused by the fungi in the genus Aspergillus. Yay, I'm so smart. Um, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. The canidia of the aspergillus organisms is inhaled and trapped in the secretions of asthmatic patients. Growth of the organism leads to hypersensitivity reactions. Hypersensitivity reaction makes what? Makes you think about IgE, binding to the mast cell in the basal field, releasing histamines. Kinines, serotonin, prostaglandins, leading to bronchoconstriction. That leads to panic. That leads to hypersecretion, increased bronchomucosa, and eosinophilia. All of that should sound familiar in the little type at the bottom of the slide. Saprophytic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, colonization of the airways by the aspergillus but there's no invasion or damage to the tissue. 
aspergilliomas, a form of saprophytic bronchopulmonary aspergilliosis where the canidia are inhaled, grow in pre-existing cavities caused by TB or healed abscesses. Right? And that fungus typically remains within the cavity for months and years without invading the cavity. Uh, what is hemophytis? Hemotysis. What is hemotysis? It occurs in 50 to 80 percent of the patients. What is that? Hemotysis. What do you think it is? Before we have somebody look it up, what, do you, what does it sound like? Sounds like blood doing something, right? Anybody have a guess? Had med term? Yeah, I've had med term. Probably made an A, 100 plus in med term, didn't you? Mm-hmm. What did you say? From your throat? Doing what? What are you doing? <laughs> Coughing up. Is that what it is? Yes, spitting up blood. Coughing up blood. Yes, yes. But these could be as simple as I think back to, uh, I've, I have a case of, uh, you know, hey, there's something on your lung x-ray. It looks like it's walled off. It's not TB, we don't think, but it could very well be aspergillomas. Um, could be. Acute invasion of bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, the most serious of the aspergillosis, where the fungus grows from inhaled canidia and invades the tissue. That's never good. Causing granulomatous lesions, bronchopneumonia, hemorrhagic infarctions. Woo. Mycelium may invade the blood vessels and disseminate to other organs like central nervous, heart, GI, thyroid. Toxins may contribute to necrosis caused by vascular obstruction. So I hope when you're down in lab today, you're, you're remembering some of these stories and you're going to be a little careful about capping and uncapping and not flicking it around the room and trying to breathe in any of it. Be careful, okay? Aflatoxins, my, mycotoxins produced by aspergillus species which grow in food items. So well, these are contaminated peanuts, rice, and corn. We have an uh, aflatoxin ingestion, and it can lead to hepatocarcinoma. Um, yeah, we, we don't think of that jumping into the grain bin. We don't think about jumping into the rice truck or the rice storage bin. I used to do that. I used to climb out, you know, those big things, you know, storage bins on the farm. I used to climb up those and jump on top of the rice and stick a big probe in there and take a big bucket of rice. Right? We're supposed to wear, but we did wear a mask. Our mask kind of looked weird then though. Y'all ever seen the old mask kind of had a little filter, like a filter mask. It was white. You could change the filter in and out. Has anybody seen those this time of year, or this time of pandemic? I don't think it provided much than just dust protection, but yeah, nobody told me I need to worry about jumping into there. Only thing they worried about was if you start sinking, right, that's a problem. I did know that. These are opportunistic species. We had asked, I think we had, I don't know if we, used, we got one of these out. You got one of these downstairs. You either have Flavus, anybody remember who had Flavus or Niger? Flavus. Okay, so we got aspergillus growing downstairs with flavus. They are opportunistic. Some more slides from your slideshow coming up. Zygomycosis. Definition here is zygomycosis is an infection caused by members of the zygomycetes, rhizopus, mucor, rhizomucor, and absidia. Systemic zygomycosis, usually associated with uncontrolled diabetics, with ketoacidosis. Okay, and which 
Which diabetes is more, yeah, have y'all studied diabetes yet? Heather, you've studied it, right? Clinical chem, body fluid. Okay, which one is more, which type is associated with ketoacidosis? Type one or type two? Type one. Type one, good job. Is that Lauren? Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Carol. The disease, the disease begins as an infection in the nasal sciences, sinuses and spreads direct extension to invade the eyes and the brain. The fungus invades the blood vessels causing thrombi and eventually destroys cranial nerves. This sounds, ugh, right? That doesn't sound pleasant at all. Zygomycosis. Zygomycosis of a heart valve. Other opportunistic infections, I hadn't got you so worried right now. Mycotic keratitis, keratitis. This is a corneal infection as a result of trauma or surgery followed by contamination of soil and decaying plant material. Okay, this corneal uh, infection can happen with aspergillus, acrimonium, curvularia, canidia, candidia albicans, and fusarium. And I think we had a, every one of these down there, didn't we? I know we had aspergillus, I know we had curvularia, I think, candidia albicans, and we had fus fusarium, didn't we not? Luckily for you, Kirk and curvularia is not growing too well, and uh, fusarium is not either. I think those are the two that are having struggles down there. Otomycosis, ear canal, trauma, medications, or other infections or irritants, aspergillus, penicillium, rhizopus, and candida. All right. So we ended a little early today. Do y'all have questions? I know that was quite a bit. I'm gonna stop the share. We hadn't stopped the recording yet. Any questions? So we, we got a few things to do downstairs. We will, you know, wrap it up with a, as much time as we can use uh, and look and hopefully we'll we show you some stuff today that makes you feel like you've had a little bit of my college. All right, see you later. Bye, Zoom.